Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, you're welcome to this session. Uh, please, can we settle down now? Um, you're welcome to this session um, titled The Battle of the African States. Uh, my name is Tudu Obamuru. I'm an associate uh, in the International Arbitration Group of White and Case, and I'm based in Paris. Um, as you know, the, the seat of arbitration is a juridical concept which um, ties an arbitration to a, a legal system. And as has been described, the seat determines which country's procedural law will apply to many of the practical aspects of arbitration, including the availability of interim remedies and the extent to which the local courts will support or supervise an arbitration. Of course, the seat will also determine where an award has been made, which may um, have significant uh, consequences for the purposes of recognizing and enforcing the awards. Um, according to the White and Case Queen Mary University International Arbitration Survey 2021, um, London and Singapore are the most attractive seats of international arbitration, followed by Hong Kong, Paris, and Geneva. Um, likewise, the, the SOAS Arbitration in Africa Survey 2020, the top five seats in Africa are Johannesburg, Lagos, Cairo, Cape Town, and Durban. Um, so given the significance of seats in international arbitration, uh, the question is, what are the factors um, that parties must take, must take into account in choosing an arbitral seat? Um, or maybe better still, it, the question is, what are the factors that make the top seat in international arbitration attractive to uh, users arbitration? According to the White and Case survey, uh, 56% 50, uh, of the respondents to the survey actually um, selected uh, greater support for arbitration by local court and judiciary as the primary reason why they prefer the top seats. 54% uh, of respondents chose the increased neutrality and impartiality of the local legal system, uh, while 47% chose uh, the top seat better track record in enforcing arbitration agreements and arbitral awards as a driver for their preference for the top seats in international arbitration. Uh, of course, this is not surprising because these points are in tandem with the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators London Centenary Principles for determining its uh, seat. Uh, they include the modern effective arbitration law independent, competent, and efficient judiciary, and of course, adherence to treaties for the recognition and enforcement um, of foreign arbitral awards and arbitration agreement, among others. And of course, there are also um, practical considerations to be taken into account in selection of a seat. Uh, you want to look at the, the, good, the availability of a good facility for conducting arbitration hearings, and of course, the accessibility of the seat uh, people and the safety of course of the seed um, so to help us interrogate the, the, this subject vis-a-vis uh, -vis the top seats in africa and how they are faring um, we have three distinguished panelists who are joining us virtually from south africa egypt and mauritius um, michael cooper is a senior counsel and arbitrator based in south africa uh, he's the chairman of the arbitration foundation of south africa uh, Andre Robert is a senior attorney and a partner at BLC Roberts and Associate. Uh, he's an arbitration lawyer who is based in Mauritius. And of course, Ismail Salim is the director of the Cairo Regional Center for International Commercial Arbitration. He's also the current vice chair of the Egypt branch of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. So the panelists will take turns to make their case regarding the development. Um, that should make their cities the preferred seat for arbitration in Africa. And the session has been divided into two, two sessions. Uh, each of the panelists will take time to speak for eight minutes in the first instance, and then they will come back, uh, spending six minutes each to respond to the submission by the other panelists and comments. 
Um, so we've reserved about 10 to 15 minutes for question and answer contribution from the audience. Uh, and so it promises to be a good um, session. So with that, I will you to un uh, Michael. Michael, you go first. Yes. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to showcase South Africa as both an attractive and credible seat for arbitration. I, I think South Africa has a strong case to make in this battle of the African arbitration seats, but whether it deserves top billing is, is a matter for you to say. There are a number of well-known criteria which are used to test the viability of any country as an arbitral seat. And I want to touch on three of those criteria in asking you to assess South Africa's claim to primacy. Each criterion identifies a vital role player and a successful seat, I want to suggest to you, requires the appropriate contribution from each of them. The first role player is the court, which must be seen to offer positive and supportive approaches to arbitration. The second role player is the arbitration community, by which I mean the legal, the accounting, the construction professions, and other stakeholders. It is for the arbitration community to offer efficient arbitral processes and to ensure high standards of practice. And the third is government. And it is a function of government to create the legislative framework for the seat. So let me apply those criteria to South Africa. I begin with the court. What in South Africa is the court's attitude to arbitration? The answer, I think, is best given in this extract from a judgment of our Supreme Court of Appeal in 2015. And I quote, South African courts not only have a legal, but also a socio-economic and political duty to encourage the selection of South Africa as a venue for international arbitrations. International arbitration in South Africa will not only foster our comity among the nations of the world, as well as international trade, but also bring about the influx of foreign spending to our country. What of the arbitration community in South Africa? Until 1996, the arbitration culture was poorly developed. In that year, our arbitration community came together to establish the Arbitration Foundation of Southern Africa as a non-profit, multifunctional arbitration center equipped with its rules, its panels of arbitrators, and its hearing facilities located in all the major centers of the country. In its first few months of activity, six local commercial disputes were referred to administration under the AFSA rules. That number grew to 60, and then to 200. And now AFSA administers some 600 local matters at any one time, and all of them involve significant commercial disputes or investment disputes. Over the years, AFSA trained close to a thousand graduates in the skills of arbitration, mediation, and conciliation. And of course, it maintains extensive and specialized panels of arbitration. Was handicapped by the inertia of the third vital role player, government. South Africa did not have an International Arbitration Act, which would have given the model law the force of law in South Africa. That legislation was eventually passed in late December 2017, 
some four and a half years ago. The effect was immediate and dramatic. AFSA was able to introduce an international division, set up its own international rules drafted by an international team of experts, <clears throat> and to establish an international secretariat answerable to its international court for policy and administration, headed by a former Chief Justice of South Africa and including international practitioners of renown. Yes, South Africa became an international seat late in the day. And yes, almost immediately we were faced with the pandemic and the slowdown in international trade and commerce. Nonetheless, ladies and gentlemen, AFSA alone now administers in excess of 100 international matters involving some 43 countries and involving many billions of dollars. And it does so at a cost which is 60% cheaper than that charged by leading arbitration centers in Europe and Asia. So, I come to the last criterion, which is more important than all the others. Never mind the theory, never mind the publicity, never mind the tub thumping. In the real world, are people actually using your country as their seat in arbitrations in South Africa? Given that AFSA alone administers some 600 local arbitrations and more than 100 international arbitrations, I would suggest that the answer is yes. South Africa is a leading African arbitral seat. By the way, in 2020, the School of Oriental and African Studies, SOAS, rated the leading African arbitration centers. I'm sure my eminent colleagues on this panel will remember which center was rated the top center in Africa. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Michael. Um, I will now turn it over to Ismail. Thank you very much, uh, Tolu. And uh, I'm very thankful to the uh, Africa Construction Law uh, Conference for uh, giving me the honor to be a speaker with the distinguished panelists uh, to speak uh, on this uh, very interesting panel uh, titled Battle of the African Arbitration Seats. Uh, well, the title is sort of uh, an attractive uh, and catchy title, uh, but I would rather say that we could call this panel uh, the synergy uh, of uh, African arbitration seat. Uh, the more, because the more we have uh, attractive arbitration seats across the continent, the more Africans and non-Africans would be encouraged to choose uh, to arbitrate in Africa. Uh, Tolu has defined uh, the seat of arbitration as a legal concept uh, and has more or less discussed uh, what are the requirements for a seat to be uh, attractive. And this was also uh, echoed by uh, my distinguished colleague, Michael Cooper, I will just remind uh, the London principles prior to discussing uh, why Cairo, Egypt is an attractive seat of arbitration. The London uh, principles were developed by the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators in 2015. And uh, these uh, uh, 10 criteria or 10 principles for a seat to be characterized as an, as an attractive one are as follows an arbitration law limiting the court intervention and with the right balance between confidentiality and transparency, an independent, competent and efficient judiciary, an independent, competent legal profession with expertise in international arbitration, 
an easy access uh, to the country for witness and counsel in a safe environment for participants, a sound legal education uh, system with the right to choose one's legal representative, whether local or foreign, a good logical, uh, uh, so, sorry, a good logistical support, including transcription, hearing rooms, translation, professional norms with ethical principles governing arbitrators and counsel, well-functioning venues for hearings and other meetings, adherence to treaties for the recognition and enforcement of foreign awards and arbitration agreements, immunity for arbitrators from civil liability. Uh, these 10 principles did not include the existence of a prominent arbitral institution within the host state or within uh, the seat uh, in question. Of course, uh, the location of the arbitral institution and the seat of arbitration are distinct uh, legal principles or are distinct concepts uh, because you can choose arbitration under the Cairo Regional Center rules, while the seat of arbitration can be elsewhere, not necessarily in Cairo, Egypt. And same for the other uh, arbitral institutions. However, I would say that there is a sort of a synergy between the location of the arbitral institution and the seat of arbitration in itself. Certainly, the more Cairo, Egypt, is an attractive seat, certainly it will boost the caseload of the Kursika and vice versa. The more Kursika would perform uh, and would abide by best arbitration practice, the more uh, uh, Kursika can indirectly or directly influence perhaps the Egyptian legislator or uh, the Egyptian judiciary uh, and this would develop the seat, and this has happened in practice. Uh, whether Kursika or Cairo is the best seat in Africa, uh, this, of course, would be left to the people, the, the, the audience, to decide. Uh, yes, Kursika was rated second in the SOAS uh, uh, survey. Uh, behind uh, AFSA as a leading, leading of arbitral institution. But as you know, uh, there are factors in surveys. Of course, the five uh, first uh, seats or the five first institutions in a survey, this means that they are certainly the leading institutions and the leading seats. But there are other factors in survey, in surveys, uh, especially the number of participants and from where the participants are located, this also plays a role. Uh, in any event, I would like now uh, to uh, demonstrate the strengths of uh, Cairo, uh, Egypt as a seat, and then to shed light on the role of the Kursika. So the legal framework, I will start with the legal framework and the role of Egyptian national courts. I will start with the Egyptian Arbitration Law number 27 for the year 1994, which is based on the Uncitral uh, Model Law of 1985 with some variations, uh, including that the Egyptian Arbitration Law applies to both domestic and international arbitrations. I would say that if we compare the year of uh, establishment of the Kursika in 1979, the Kursika, before the enactment of the modern Egyptian legislation, has only registered 42 cases. So uh, from 79 to 1994, the Kursika had only registered 42 cases, which means three cases per year in average. Following the enactment of the modern Egyptian arbitration law of 1994, uh, the caseload of the Kursika started to grow steadily and certainly the modern Egyptian law was a catalyst. Uh, Egypt is a party to numerous conventions relating to arbitration, the New York Convention of 1958, and this was since uh, the uh, uh, 
uh, establishment since uh, this the, the signing of the New York Convention, uh, Egypt ratified the New York Convention a few months later. Also, Egypt is a member of the Exit Convention of 1965, and also is a member of another reg of a regional convention, which is the Riyadh Convention in 1983. So this means that if you are arbitrating in Libya or in Somalia, which did not agree uh, adhere to the New York Convention or did not ratify the New York Convention yet, you can arbitrate in Egypt and enforce your award based on the Riyadh Convention, uh, because both Libya and Somalia, because they are member of the Arab League of Nations, then you can enforce your award not based on the New York Convention, because they did not ratify it yet, but based on the Riyadh Convention. Uh, the Egyptian arbitration law has, of course, um, uh, uh, adopted all the uh, modern uh, features of international arbitration, the competence, competence, the separability of arbitration clause, arbitrators are not requ required to be of a given gender, religion of nation or nationality, etc. So the different modern features of the modern law. Uh, generally speaking, uh, the Egyptian arbitration law gives priority to the, to the parties' agreement to recourse to arbitration and guarantee that the arbitration process is fair and just. Uh, the Egyptian arbitration law also provides for a limited court intervention during the proceedings and following the rendering of an award. I will give you an example of uh, such limited intervention of courts, uh, which, in, which is in favor of institutional arbitration. An example is uh, on challenges to arbitrators. One of the modern features of international arbitration is to permit the institution to decide upon challenges against arbitrators. And the Kursika, the Cairo Regional Center, has a, a multinational uh, advisory committee composed from uh, very prominent arbitration practitioners from many countries and the work, uh, so uh, this uh, advisory committee decides upon challenges against arbitrators for lack of impartiality and uh, independence. Uh, and it was very important that uh, the courts acknowledge this role because it has happened that there was a debate to know whether the obligation to refer the challenge uh, request whether uh, to the to the state courts whether it applies only to ad hoc arbitration or to institutional arbitration as well some losing parties used to invoke an alleged public policy nature of the role of state courts in deciding uh, in challenges against arbitrators even in institutional arbitration However, uh, the Egyptian Court of Cassation rendered a decision on 16 February uh, 2022. So a very recent decision of the Egyptian Court of Cassation. And this decision was just doing nothing but confirming uh, the long-standing ruling of the Cairo Court of Appeal. Uh, both courts, so the Egyptian Court of Cassation and the Cairo Court of Appeal, they both held that Article 19 of the Egyptian Arbitration Law, which regulates challenges against arbitrators, is exclusive to ad hoc arbitration, exclusive to situations where the parties have not agreed to institutional rules regulating challenges against arbitrators and concluded that the decision on the challenges against arbitrators by the Kursika pursuant to the parties' agreement, is not a ground for setting aside uh, the oath. Hi, Ismail. Um, you Did I think two I minutes left or around. Yeah, thank two you. minutes. OK. Uh, I will then turn to uh, the effect of, of Cairo as a seat, the synergy between Cairo as a seat and Kursika as a major institution uh, in Egypt. and 
in the MENA region and Africa. So Kersika is an international organization uh, established in 1979 uh, by virtue of an agreement between ALCO and the Egyptian uh, government. Uh, Kersika uh, uh, enjoys immunities and privileges, ensuring its independence functioning vis-à-vis -vis, uh, the host state. It, uh, it has registered last year 83 new arbitrations, and throughout its existence, it has registered more than 1,550 uh, cases. Uh, it, also, it has also issued dispute board rules and mediation uh, rules. And every year it registered a significant number of cases which are international uh, cases, not involving Egyptian parties. So by way of example, uh, last year, 2021, parties to the dispute included 34 non-Egyptian parties with six coming from the UAE, five from the United Kingdom, from Malta, and three uh, from uh, Saudi Arabia. And other non-Egyptian parties came from the Bahama, the British Virgin Islands, Bulgaria, Cyprus, France, Italy, Lebanon, Liechtenstein, Panama, South Africa, Ukraine, and the United States. Uh, and the Kersika published its uh, uh, statistics regularly on its website and through its uh, uh, newsletters, uh, which are uh, distributed to its main list. Finally, I would say, last but not least, the Kersika participates in legal education and other. It hosts uh, the Egypt branch of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, and together they uh, deliver the uh, uh, accreditation course uh, to the Chartered Institute. And it holds, and I will finish with that, the sole biannual conference on the role of state courts in international arbitration. I will conclude thank with you. this uh, to respect my eight minutes, and uh, I thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you so much, Ismail. Um, just coming back to a point you made about um, the, the London principles not including um, the presence of an institution um, as one of the determinants of uh, a safe seat. Um, the, the, the respondent to the White and case of the body 2015 and 2021 survey uh, say one of the reasons why they prefer to arbitrate in Singapore is because of one of the considerations is the presence of uh, SIAC. So we know that the institution um, uh, having a good institution in the region uh, is one of those things that parties will take into account in, in selecting a seat. Okay, with that, I will turn it over to Andre. Tell us about Mauritius. Good evening, Tolu. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Do you hear me, first of all? Do you hear yes. me, Yes. Yes, we hear you clearly. Well, why choose Mauritius as a seat for international arbitration? You will be sad with the answer. I will not give you the one you want. It is not because we have joy, we have fun, we have seasons in the sun, as they say in the song. It is because we have something much more thrilling for a lawyer than joy, fun, and seasons in the sun. It is because we have law and we have case law. This is why you come to Mauritius. We have good laws which are well applied by our courts. Those are the two main ideas of my intervention. Before going into those two main ideas, I will just point out that we have two main centers, arbitration centers in Mauritius. The MCCI Mediation and Arbitration Center and the Mauritius International Arbitration Center, also called MIAC. Both have their facilities, uh, arbitration rooms, uh, uh, breakout rooms, and so on. Previously, uh, we used to go to hotels, but uh, according to what I hear, this was not too much appreciated by the lawyers who prefer mediation rooms to hotels and they have thus developed very well-established rooms in Port Louis, 
uh, with all the facilities. Uh, those two mediation centers, uh, arbitration centers, have their media arbitration rules, which are based on international principles and generally established principles and well-tested rules. So this as an introduction. Now our laws. Our laws, we have laws regarding domestic arbitration, but those have been specifically excluded by the International Arbitration Act for international arbitrations. We've asked for international arbitrations have two basic laws. The first law in the International Arbitration Act of 2008. The second one is the convention, uh, the New York Convention, which has been enacted in our law. I will just make as part one of my presentation, a brief overview of the laws. Before going to part two of my presentation, which is how those laws have been applied and whether they have been given their intent or whether our courts have departed from their intent. We will clearly see part two that our laws, but our courts have gone directly in the intent of a legislator and have adopted a very true arbitration approach. So part one will deal with the laws. We have an International Arbitration Act, which is based on the model laws amended in 2006. Uh, as 2006. And that act states clearly that international arbitration is distinct from domestic arbitration and has different sets of rules. It is, this is basic, this is, I, I will not go into all the details in view of the limited time available, but I would just give you some extracts that, for example, the law states that regard shall be had to the origin of the model law, the corresponding provisions of which are set out in the first schedule, and to the need to promote uniformity in the application of the law and the observance of good faith. The law goes on by stating that any question governing concerning matters governed by the amended model law, which is not expressly settled in that law, shall be settled in conformity with general principles on which that law is based. Uh, recourse shall be had to international materials regarding the amended model law. Relevant reports of UN Citral, relevant reports of and, and, and analytical commentaries on, of a UN Citral Secretariat, textbooks, articles, and commentaries of the model law. So we clearly have an international approach. It's not a domestic approach. Domestic is guarded away. We go for international and international law and international principles. And this goes on uh, in, uh, by stating, for example, that in applying and interpreting this act and the, Con and the New York Convention Act, and in developing the law applicable in international arbitration, no recourse shall be had to and no account shall be taken of the law or the procedure relating to domestic arbitration. There is a clear separation between the two. We go for international and not domestic. That's the first point. The second one is the appointment and challenges of the arbitrators, which are closely monitored by the, P by the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague, with a permanent presence of a representative of the Permanent Court of Arbitration in malicious. So if ever you want, to, for all questions, appointment of arbitrators, challenges of arbitrators, and so on, it's not the courts. The courts do not get involved with it. You go to The Hague, and very and, and you don't you, you can't appeal against the Hague, the, the Hague. So it's clearly international. It's the, the role is the Hague, it's not malicious. You don't have the courts in this. And and the, the decisions of the Hague are not appealable. If ever you want to contest, it's the final decision of the arbitrator which can be challenged, even that we'll see in extremely limited circumstances. That's the first thing, the, the second point. The third point is. If ever someone comes to the malicious courts and says, I want to present a case and there is an arbitration clause, what happens? What happens is that the defending party raises the flag and says, no, my friend, no right to go to the courts. There is an arbitration clause in the agreement. What do the courts do? The courts, firstly, are bound, to, the, the courts before which the, the, the matter is raised are bound to refer the matter to specialists 
designated judges. It's not a sing ordinary judge. Once you raise the flag, you say arbitration clause, the judge says, okay, I'm moving off. I refer this to a panel of designated judge. And those designated judges are specialist judges, trained, specially trained for arbitration. And those specialist judges, what do they have? Their hands are tight. They can't move. Why they can't move is because they have, as per the law, a very restrictive role. Their role is there not to say, I am the big judge. Their role is there to say, you have signed an arbitration agreement, you must go to arbitration. So what the law says is that the, when the court shall, uh, the Supreme Court shall refer the matter to arbitration unless a party shows on a prima facie basis that there is a very strong probability that the arbitration agreement may be non-invoid, inoperative, or incapable of being performed. So there are very strict tests. We'll see how the courts have applied, but the courts have applied the text of the law. The court doesn't come and say, I want to look at what the parties have said. I want to hear evidence. I want to hear all this. I want to hear all that. Unless there is a prima facie case, but there is a very strong probability that the arbitration agreement would be maybe null and void, inoperative, or incapable of being performed. So, in effect, hi, Andre. Going to I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, you have two minutes more, please. Okay. Well, uh, I would I would then just go quickly on 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 the points. Uh, so, as I have stated, there are these specialist designated judges, very limited court intervention. Uh, very, there are very limited possibilities to contest or challenge awards. It's extremely difficult to contest or challenge awards. Foreign lawyers and any person chosen by the parties can appear freely before the arbitrators. So you don't need to have to be a qualified uh, Mauritian lawyer to be able to appear before the, uh, an arbitral panel in Mauritius. And uh, the court can also hold sittings in private. So those are the basic reasons. Uh, the, the, the second law is the New York Convention, of which you are all aware. Uh, I will not go into the New York Convention. I will just uh, draw specific to attention to two points. Firstly, that uh, this, the law has been amended to provide that the Convention shall apply uh, even if there is no reciprocity. So the, the, the requirement of reciprocity has been abolished in 2013. The second thing for French speak speakers is that the law provides that English or French shall be deemed to be official language of Mauritius for the terms of a New York Convention. So if ever you're a French speaker, you, you, you can very easily address yourself to the court, and that's a, a, an attractive an element to attract the jurisdiction. All Mauritians speak French, and all Mauritians are fluent in French. Part two, of, on which I will obviously have a few minutes, is the case law. I will not go into it. I have 20 pages on the case law, but I'll try to stick myself to, to the important elements. All the case law has been extremely pro-arbitration. There have been attempts to quash the case law on basis of public policy. Those cases have been uh, have been dismissed. And, and, and an important element of the malicious jurisdiction is that if ever any decision of the courts is challenged, you go directly to the Privy Council in London. So you have that security of knowing that if ever you're not happy with a court decision, you don't have to go through a long appeal process. Firstly, you have three judges to hear, which will hear your case. Secondly, if ever you're not happy with the decision of the three judges, directly Privy Council by the law lords in England, which is a, a great security aspect for the litigants. And the, the Privy Council has adopted a very pro uh, arbitration decisions like the Betamax versus State Trading Corporation uh, case, which is a leading case of the Privy Council, which is extremely pro arbitration. And I will not go into all the cases, but if, uh, I, if, uh, if ever I you. go into this, I think I made my point. Th thank you, Andre. Um, so I, I, I will just pick up from there and, and start the second round with you. But instead of six minutes, you now have two minutes. So, I mean, we, we, we all know. Mauritius has one of the best uh, legal infrastructure in, uh, for arbitration in Africa. Uh, but it, it seems uh, things slow down after the... Oh. I, th I think we lost Andre.
maybe you try to call in. Um, but whilst we're waiting for um, Andre, I think I would pick up with you, uh, Ismail. Um, so we saw the development. Oh, okay, Andre is back. Yes. Uh, okay. Sorry, Ismail. I'll come back to you. Um, Andre, are you here now? Yes, I'm here. here. I'm calling IT just to to to, to assist me. Okay. okay. Um, so I, I was asking you that um, since 2018, um, following the the end of the LCIA uh, MIAC uh, joint venture, uh, it seems uh, there's a slowdown of activity in terms of um, arbitration in uh, Mauritius. Uh, so is there something being done at the something to be uh, to be done to ensure that? Uh, Mauritius remain um, the go-to place as we all expected it to be, especially after the, the ICA Congress in 2016. You, you are right and you are not right. You are right because there has effectively been a slowdown in international arbitration cases, but this has only been temporary for a few months pending uh, during the transition period, which has not taken more than a few months. Uh, the, the trend has then picked up for two reasons. Reason number one is that in 2019, there has been uh, official uh, uh, new facilities which have been set up for arbitrations, and this has in, in port with, and this has greatly prompted the parties to increase the number of arbitrations in Mauritius. And since the, the, the center was opened, uh, the number of cases has definitely increased. Number two is that there is a cooperation agreement between Mauritius and the PCA in The Hague, which has been signed in 2018, whereby The Hague provides all necessary assistance to MIAC. And this has been the second factor why the number of cases has improved and it has given confidence to the parties that there is The Hague behind it is not left just just left in the hands of the Mauritian Arbitration Center. It is backed up by the Hague, and the, the, the transitional period of a few months has quickly disappeared, and cases are coming back. Uh, thank you, Andre. Um, Ismail, so in we, we saw how the Egyptian court um, swiftly responded to the unfortunate incident where um, a local arbitration. Uh, institution where well, some arbitrators conducting uh, a sham arbitration under a, uh, the rules of a local arbitration institution awarded um, 18 billion dollars against Chevron uh, and the court responded swiftly um, by putting them behind bars. Um, at, at their step or has any step been taken to um, you know, avoid the reoccurrence of uh, such situation? And in what way did that impact um, the attractiveness of Egypt as um, an arbitration seat? Uh, thank you, Tolo. Of course, uh, no one can deny that uh, the, the Chevron uh, case uh, was, uh, um, uh, was a risk to give a bad reputation of arbitration in Egypt. But uh, it should be limited to the Chevron case because it's a single case. Although it's, uh, the, the amount of the award is exorbitant, uh, but this does not uh, negate that uh, Egypt has a very good reputation uh, for international arbitration due to Kerseka and due to the role of its judges. Uh, the Court of Cassation and the Cairo Court of Appeal have issued decisions matching the level of the major European arbitration seats. And the Egyptian Arbitration Act is known uh, for uh, being a modern arbitration uh, law. How did we face this uh, phenomenon of sham centers? I will have to mention in this respect the decision of the Egyptian Court of Cassation that was rendered in 2019. This decision pertained to uh, an arbitral award, unfortunately um, rendered under the auspices of this sham center, which is called uh, the uh, uh, International Arbitration Center, and it's based in Heliopolis, Nozha, 
which is uh, an area in Cairo. If we add to the effect of the criminal uh, decision, the criminal court decision, which is uh, w w which would deter other sham centers from repeating the wrongdoing of the Chevron case, this uh, decision of the Cairo, uh, the Egyptian Court of Cassation, has clearly defined what is an arbitral institution under the Egyptian Arbitration Act. So it is not sufficient by virtue of this landmark decision. Uh, it has considered that uh, any arbitral award rendered under the auspices of this sham center is not institutional arbitration. It has considered that this is an ad hoc arbitration, even if it is under the auspices of such sham center. And the Cairo Court of Cassation has defined what are the criteria to consider that an arbitral award rendered under the auspices of a center would be considered as an institutional arbitral award. So the Cairo Court of Cass the Egyptian Court of Cassation has mentioned that the arbitration institution must have a set of modern rules which are published or which are made available to the public. Uh, it must have an experience in administering arbitral um, uh, uh, cases, a long experience, and having uh, a strong case management uh, in order for the users to feel that they enjoy legal security and procedural security by referring their arbitration to such an arbitration center. If this, these conditions are uh, fulfilled, then it is institutional arbitration. One last thing, and I would like to draw the attention of legislators. Some legislators would be tempted to provide for licensing arbitration centers in order to combat sham centers. This is a very bad practice. It has been done in certain countries of the MENA region, and this is a very bad practice because it will open the door for sham centers being licensed. And then this act will have a negative effect on the image of the relevant ministry that would have licensed a sham center. And by the way, the, the center that has issued or that has administered, if we can say the word administered, uh, the Chevron case, unfortunately, was in the past licensed by the Ministry of Justice in Egypt. So that's why uh, the response uh, will hopefully never be the licensing of our <coughs> Thank, thank you, Ismail. Um, so, Michael, uh, just in two minutes, because we're out of time now. Um, so we've seen a dramatic shift in, 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 in South Africa. The, the cases are coming in, but there are still a uh, very low um, number of international cases coming to Johannesburg. Um, wh what are the other areas that you think steps need to be taken, uh, both by the, the AFSA and by uh, the South African government to ensure uh, that um, uh, South Africa remains um, uh, uh, open and attractive to international arbitration? Yes. Well, you know, I, I would think that uh, South Africa, for reasons which we will all understand, has in the last three or four years been flying under the radar. It's flying under the radar because the, the best way to publicize one's achievements and to uh, send the message that from an arbitration point of view, you are open to business, the best way to do it is the way that you are doing it at the moment, through law conferences and through uh, meetings of global representatives. And uh, ironically for us, we had organized Johannesburg Arbitration Week, a massive get-together for a presentation of AFSA and South Africa to the world. And we had scheduled it for March 2019. And just as we came to the moment of hosting the conference, so the pandemic intervened. But now, as you are showing, in your conference, 
the time has come again for all African arbitration institutions to begin to present themselves to the world. And we schedule about this time next year a major conference which we will hold, we think, not in South Africa, but in the Seychelles. And we will do that because we will be presenting to the world not merely the achievements and the attractiveness of a South African arbitration regime, but that of a Southern African regime, one that incorporates and includes all the members of SADC, so that the 16 Southern African countries can develop a standardized, harmonized arbitration profile. And I hope to the best interests of, of, of the Southern African region. Thank you. Is it the end of the session? No, oh. no it's not. Oh, okay. Now we're talking to the audience. They may have questions for you, so. It's not working? You can use Good afternoon, all. Thank you so very much for your excellent presentations. Uh, I know you all very well, and it is wonderful to be here. Uh, I, I would have been nice if you all were here, but uh, you've made some excellent presentations, and long may Africa be a wonderful, powerful center for dispute resolution and in arbitrations. Thank you. Okay. Other questions or comments? Okay. They don't, they don't want to answer your questions. No? So, okay, so I turn to you again, Michael. Um, so, so you are talking to us about the, the, um, the conference in Seychelles, and I know there is some organizations between um, the, the Southern African countries. Um, what, what role um, is the AFSA, uh, you, you're the current chairman of AFSA, and you also hold some position in the um, organization of Southern African lawyers. So what's the collaboration um, going on between the uh, two organizations? Yes, there is a um, agreement signed between the uh, SADC Lawyers Association and AFSA, the purpose of which is to raise the profile of arbitration in the SADC countries and to do that by standardizing and harmonizing arbitral practice in the SADC countries. And there seems to us to be um, three um, great promises coming out of the region. The one is the development of arbitration on a local level throughout the SADC countries. But the second is the development of a regional dispute resolution uh, system for SADC, following perhaps the kind of example that OHADA has given to us. And then thirdly, of course, to encourage the um, general, uh, general appreciation in global cir circles of the, of the uh, welcoming nature 
of all the SADC countries um, as part of a credible, united, arbitral system. And I'm certainly hoping that Mauritius will play a very important part in helping to construct that regional unification around the importance of arbitration. Thank you. Um, Ismail, I, I know um, the regional center also has uh, some cooperation going on, is it with OHADA or other organizations in the Africa? Tell us, uh, in Africa, tell us about um, the various initiatives to ensure that um, the regional center in Cairo uh, keeps playing its leading role, uh, especially in the region and with other institutions in the continent. Uh, thank you very much. So, um, in addition to many cooperation agreements that have been concluded between Kersika and other uh, arbitration centers on the African continent, I would like to share my experience uh, of last week. I spent a full week in Tanzania. Uh, it was a workshop organized by uh, GIZ, the, the German, the, the famous uh, German organization that funds initiative. So GIZ now is uh, funding an initiative on developing uh, arbitration centers across the African continent. In Tanzania, a new arbitration center uh, is provided for in uh, the new Tanzanian law, the Tanzanian law of 2020, which has been recently amended. It provides for uh, the Tanzanian arbitration center, TAC, which is relatively a recent arbitration uh, center. And the aim of this workshop was to benefit from the experience of other arbitration centers, whether in Africa or from outside Africa, so that Tanzania could benefit from uh, this experience. Um, there are other arbitration centers in Tanzania that were present, present during this workshop. This workshop lasted for four days. Uh, and we discovered that there are three other arbitration centers in Tanzania, which are uh, a working arbitration centers. They have a certain caseload, at least two among them. So one of the experience that were, so Kersika shared its own experience. We have mentioned uh, the, that we humbly disagree with any attempt to license arbitration centers. This is a wrong practice. It's not best practice. Or to license arbitrators. So also, this is uh, not a good practice. Any party should, be, should have the freedom to choose its own arbitrator. So we emphasize on that. And uh, so the Tanzanian, our Tanzanian brothers were able to benefit from this experience because I said the same. And other centers like the Swiss Arbitration Center was present. The DIS, the German Arbitration Center, was present. The Kigali Center was present. And we all talked about best arbitration practice. And we emphasize on the fact that arbitrators should not be licensed. The choice of arbitrators should be based on party autonomy. And ourselves, Kersika, 85% of uh, arbitrators under Kersika rules are appointed by the parties. The institution only interferes exceptionally and only in 15 percentage of the cases according to our statistics uh, thank you thank you so much um andrew you you were you were talking to us about some of the cases where uh the recent development in in, in mauritius and i know um, there was a case where the there was an arbitration award um uh, that was granted against uh, one of the state agencies, I think uh, uh, a property company for the state. And the, the Supreme Court of Mauritius set aside the award on public policy, violation of public policy ground. And it was um, appealed to the Privy Council, which of course reinstated the award. Um, is, is that one of, one of the cases that you wanted to talk to us about? Um, that, that is one of the cases because I think it goes to the root of arbitration and the root of how far the courts can go in uh, quashing arbitral awards. In that case, the 
arbitral tribunal had held that the contract was a valid one. It was a procurement contract. It was quashed by the Mauritius Supreme Court on the ground that uh, there had been breach of procurement laws and that procurement laws being a matter of Mauritius public policy, uh, the award should be quashed. It went to the Privy Council, as you rightly say, and on this issue of public policy, there are two leading judgments in Mauritius. The first one, before the Betamax versus State Trade Incorporation case, is the Cruz City case, where the local courts have clearly stated that public policy refers to international public policy. They again laid emphasis on the fact that public policy is international public policy and not Mauritius public policy under the International Arbitration Act. That is the first judgment which clearly states out the international aspect of the law and the international public policy. Now, the question before the Privy Council was, well, if you, you go and state that uh, a contract is valid and then a party goes to appeal and said, well, it goes against public policy, then the law lord said, well, each and every contract, you, you plead public policy and each and every contract will, will go, there, there, will be, uh, there will be challenges to, to, be, to be attempt to, to, to set aside the awards on ground of public policy. So the law law stated, well, the, there has been, the arbitrator has held that the contract is valid. It is not for the courts now to come and put that in question on ground of public policy and the, the judgment of the local court was, was quashed. So the, 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 the law law is telling you, well, if you, you go and plead public policy, each and every case, you, you go and, and apply for setting aside of arbitral awards on ground of breach of public policy. And so they, they sort of laid the boundaries as to where the public policy comes in and where, where, what are the sort of frontiers of a public policy. It was actually a good outcome. And uh, for practitioners uh, in international arbitration, it was uh, comforting that the, 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 the Privy Council could uh, reverse um, the decision of, of the, the Mauritius Supreme Court the way it did uh, in that matter, especially against uh, an agency of the government uh, of Mauritius. So I, I, I was just wondering, is there any form of um, maybe some question as to the, the British, uh, the, the Privy Council overturning um, the decision of the highest court in, in Mauritius, just out of among the, 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 the lawyers, any form of agitation whatsoever as a result of that? I will just step in to say two things. Firstly, it's good for the arbitration community that the arbitration, uh, that the Privy Council quashes a decision. I think it shows to the arbitration community that if ever you're not happy, you can go to London and the, the London persons will quash the awards. That's the first point I have to say. There is the security aspect. The second thing I have to say is that a number of other Privy Council judgments have maintained judgments of the Mauritius Court. Uh, it's uh, uh, a number of other Privy Council judgments which went and appealed to the Privy Council have held that the application of the law by the Mauritius Court was right and correct. So it, it, it shows that well, one judgment was quashed, but a number of them was, were, were maintained, and those judgments were quite pro-arbitration ones. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so except uh, there's any question from the audience, uh, I will ask you to join me. Uh, ah, OK. So my name is Luma Lasyunis from Nairobi, Kenya. Um, that was a very interesting uh, discussion, listening to perspectives from the different regions and the centers there. I'm more keen to know, and much as I don't have any you know, substantive question, but just to understand the center, the foundation in South Africa, uh, is it involved in any form of research, you know? 
there's a lot of development in the area of use of technology in arbitration and international arbitration, for example, particularly uh, <coughs> post-COVID and during COVID uh, time. Is the foundation looking at any funding uh, opportunities and research in, in those emerging areas? And wh what are the findings in terms of use of uh, um, those emerging technologies? We hear of uh, use of uh, robots. Uh, to help with research uh, and in arbitration processes to help summarize, uh, look at the strength of the case and advise the arbitrators, for example. Is there any deliberate uh, move towards research? Um, that question will be for Michael. Um, but after that, there's a question on the screen for Andre. I don't know if you can see that, Andre. Yes, I see it. Thank you. Okay, so after Michael, uh, and Andre will yes. go for the question on the screen. Thank you. I'm, I'm terribly sorry, Tolu, and I'm terribly sorry uh, to the lady who was putting that question. Uh, some of it didn't come through very clearly to me, so I've, I've, I've missed precisely the, the topic on which you was asking whether we had conducted research or, or begun to, to take steps. So if you could just get for me um, the, the, the particular um, interest that was being identified. Um, yes, so the, 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 question, the question is essentially about um, the use of technology um, in, in arbitration, especially post-COVID era. Um, is there any development uh, in that regard, especially with AFSA and what are the steps that have been taken? Yes. Well, I'm, I'm not sure that I'm, I'm answering uh, the question, but if what is, in, what is uh, being asked about are the use that has been made in, uh, in technology to assist us during the, um, during the COVID era, uh, the answer has been that we have developed um, very useful platforms uh, for the be, for the um, running of arbitrations remotely, and the bulk of our arbitrations in the last two years have indeed been remote, and have required us to uh, initiate and to implement uh, protocols which deal with all the various uh, difficulties that arise when you have a, a remote hearing uh, and you will find on our website the the terms of the protocol that we have developed and we find has been has been very useful in producing a a viable um, remote arbitration platform um, i'm i'm not sure in what other respects the the quit to what other respects the the question relates Does that answer your question? Or does that answer your question? But in terms of my interest is whether foundations and associations like those are deliberately thinking and planning and involved and putting funds into research in, uh, in emerging technology, for example, in the area of arbitration. Forget about the platforms we create and adjustments in rules for arbitration, but are we funding research, you know, or we are not involved? Are we or we are not? It's more or less a question of we are or we are not. The focus of our research is into the, um, into the arbitral practices and, and traditions of the SADC countries. Uh, and there we, we promote a lot of research as a first step in order to standardize uh, arbitration practice in those countries. Um, that is, that is the, the area in which we're, we're doing original research. Okay, thank you, Michael. Um, Andre, you want to take the next question? 
Uh, the next question is the answer to the question is set out in section 3A of the Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards Act, which reads as follows. The Convention shall apply to the recognition and enforcement of all arbitral awards made in the territory of a state other than Mauritius, irrespective of whether or not there is reciprocity on behalf of that state. So that places Mauritius as an arbitration-friendly state, whereby an arbitration award of a foreign country can be implemented in Mauritius, whether or not there is reciprocity. I think that it clearly lays the ground that Mauritius is arbitration friendly and that arbitration awards in Mauritius will not be uh, 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 not be implemented under the New York Convention on the ground of non-reciprocity. I think uh, it, it clearly places that arbitration awards are respected in Mauritius and that Mauritius is an arbitration friendly country. Thank you. Uh, I think we have one more question and then we come to the end of the session. Somebody raising up. Any other question, please? Okay. Um, well, thank you so much. Um, please join me in thanking our distinguished panelists, uh, Michael, Ismail, and Andre. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you for your attention. Hey, that's it. <laughs>